You take your Bible and turn to John 17 with me, please. John 17 is that wonderful prayer that we get to hear our Lord Jesus pray just prior to him going to the cross. John 17, give you a moment to find it. And while you're finding it, I wonder how, who here has a driver's license? Raise your hand if you have a driver's license. Okay, good number of you do. I thought you had one, Renee. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> hey, do you remember uh, preparing for the driver's test? Do you remember reading the driver's manual and uh, you studied it, right? Uh, really, you, you know what? You can, you can thoroughly know the driving uh, manual and yet, that does not necessarily mean you can drive a car <laughs> because there's a lot of people that uh, study that driver's manual and uh, then they get to, to the testing spot and they flunk the test. Even though they know all the stuff, they flunk the test because there's a big difference, right, between theoretical knowledge and uh, practical knowledge. And that's really, there's two kinds of knowledge knowledges that uh, we can talk about. Uh, you can know something just by observing, just by theory. You can know the facts about a subject. But another kind of knowledge, of course, is learning by personal experience. Uh, learning about a subject by experience. Well, the knowledge that the Bible uses to describe God's relationship with his people is that second kind. The kind of knowledge that God wants you to have about him is not a theoretical knowledge. He wants you to have a personal knowledge of him. And that's what I'd like to share with you tonight. As we look at John 17, uh, Jesus begins his prayer to his heavenly father, and uh, he says in verse 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, Jesus prays. This is eternal life. What is? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent that they might know thee. He's talking about a personal knowledge, a personal knowledge about the person of God. When Jesus talks about knowing God, he's talking about something that is experienced and not just head knowledge. You know, people talk a lot about knowing something but the Bible, knowing something, as I said a moment ago, is personal and it's experiential. That's how you should understand that word K-N-O-W in that third verse of John 17. To know God really is that word first appears in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And in that verse, it says, and, and Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and brought forth a son. That word know is that word for the one flesh husband wife relationship. And that's what I want to bring into this word in John 17, 3. To know God, to know the Father is a deep, personal and intimate and reciprocal relationship. It's the equivalent of a person knowing their spouse, which of course is so much different than knowing math or history. In fact, in Revelation chapter 2, the first church, the first letter to the church at Ephesus, this was a wonderful church in many ways. They were right on target doctrinally. They had the ability to discern truth from error. 
And uh, if they identified error, they dealt with it. And the Lord gives them that as really a commendation. But then in the fourth verse, he says, nevertheless, despite that, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And so it's not about being right on as far as doctrine is concerned, if you're not on regarding your love relationship with the Lord. It's important. I'm not saying that doctrine is not important. But what the Lord says, it's just as important that our hearts be right with the Lord, that we be in deep love with our Lord, that we know him that we have a relationship with him like a husband-wife relationship where we become mingled one with another, where two become one. You know, in, in fact, that's what salvation is. The Bible says that when you're saved, your human spirit is wedded to the spirit of Christ. That's what the scripture says. And so to know him as Jesus defines it, to know God is, is a desire to have your life merged with him. And you can't be separated from him. You become one with him. So I guess I want to ask this question. When Jesus prays this for us, that they might know thee, the only true God, I want us to ask ourselves this. Do we really know God? Or do we simply know about God? How would you gauge yourself this evening as you sit here, as you listen? Do you really know God? Or do you just know about God? How real is he? How intimate is he? and deeply personal is your relationship with him. I want to look at another example, and this is Exodus chapter 33, if you'll jump back there with me for a moment. Ex Exodus chapter 33, you know, thir 32, a big problem. That's the incident of the golden calf worship, right? That was a big uh, problem. In Exodus 33, Moses is dealing with all that has happened. And God's backed away, right, from the people of Israel. And so Moses is concerned about God's presence. And what we have in Exodus uh, 33 is experiential knowledge in the life of Moses. It's about the presence of God. Jesus was talking about the person of God. Moses here is concerned with the presence of God. Because he's ready to lead Israel to enter into the promised land. And Moses is listening attentively to God's instructions. And uh, he's responding to God's direction. And so he wants to know. He doesn't want to miss anything. He wants to know who God plans to send along to help him bear the burden of this awesome leadership. Because Moses, at this point, is absolutely overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed with these people, their sin, with their complaints, and with their constant criticism. And so he has a, a sense of a, of a strong need and an intense desire for God's presence to be with him. In fact, if you look at verse 12, Moses said unto the Lord, See? Thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also uh, found grace in, I have also found grace in your sight. And then in verse 15, uh, he said to God, if your presence doesn't go with me, carry us not up thence. And God assures him, look at verse 14, God assures him, and he said, my presence or my face shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And in grateful desperation, 
Moses cries out in that 13th verse, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may, there it is again, know thee. He's talking about an experiential knowledge that is a result of God's presence with him. That's what he desires. Now, wait a minute. Think about this. This man, Moses, he watched a bush burn without that bush being consumed and becoming a a heap of ashes. He heard a disembodied voice coming out of that bush. He was instructed by God to throw down his shepherd's staff, and that staff became a snake. He was instructed by God to put his hand into his, uh, his robe and take it out, and his hand was white with leprosy. And he put it back in, and it was completely clean again. This Moses was there and saw the success of 10 awesome plagues that God brought upon the entire nation of Egypt, including the death of every single firstborn Egyptian male, human, and animal. He witnessed the breaking and the humbling of the proud and powerful Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He saw the Red Sea and its waters part to deliver Israel. He drank water from a rock that he was just spoke to, and a river flowed out of it. He ate bread that daily God rained from heaven upon the ground. Moses stood on the top of a mountain that smoked and flamed without being consumed and without dying. Moses was given the law that we call the Old Covenant by the very finger and hand of God. He watched all of this, and yet he asked to know more of God himself because Moses was not satisfied with miracles. He wanted to know the source of the miracles. He wanted to know God personally. Israel wanted miracles. But Moses saw all of that and more than they did, and he hungered for something more. He hungered for God himself. So I want to, again, have us ask ourselves this vital question tonight. Are you heart hungry for more of God or for more of what God does. You know, the miracles that God performs, the deliverance that God gives to people is marvelous. I think it's a great danger that we become too enamored with the deliverance and we miss the deliverer. Do we want the deliverance or do we want the deliverer? What are we really heart hungry for tonight? And then one other, go over to the New Testament with me to Philippians, this time chapter three, the last uh, passage we'll turn to tonight. Philippians chapter three, here is the, the autobiography of a great believer great man of God. We know him originally as Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. What a man of really religious and spiritual privilege he was, right? And yet look at what he says. He says in verse 8 of Philippians 3, I count all that as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Remember, that knowledge isn't theoretical knowledge. That knowledge isn't book knowledge. That knowledge is personal, experiential knowledge. He goes on to say this, and be found in him, verse 9, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ. 
And then he says in verse 10 that, and here's the word again, that I may know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And then shockingly, he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know that. Being made conformable unto his death. So here is a knowledge of the power of God. A practical, a practical knowledge. Back in May of 1980, Mount St. Helens blew its top. The whole north side of that uh, volcanic uh, mountain in the Cascade Range just collapsed. And as a result of that volcanic explosion, uh, a ash and smoke cloud blew 15 miles into the sky. And it covered uh, 20 some states and uh, I think five Canadian provinces as well. Everything in its path in a six-mile uh, swath was just moved. All the trees went over like toothpicks. I've been there, and I've seen the, the actual destruction of it. It's amazing. They said that the explosion of Mount St. Helens was equal to 26 megatons of TNT, which is 1,600 times more powerful than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Amazing. That was just one volcano. Paul says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That he might have a personal knowledge that would be put to good use, good practical use that would be expressed in a death-to-life power. As amazing as the power of that volcanic explosion, I don't believe that there is anything that compares to the power of God taking a dead body and bringing it back to life. God taking death and bringing life out of death. And this is the power that he wants to practically know. He wants that power of God in his life. And what's shocking is that in order to experience that kind of power, that death to life power of God, it requires two things that he mentions here in this 10th verse. Number one, it requires suffering. I don't want that power then, do you? It requires suffering. Part of effective growing and serving as a believer is being a burden bearer for the Lord. And whatever that burden that he puts on us, whatever hardship that entails, whatever target we become as people who love the Lord and want his gospel to be uh, proclaimed worldwide, Paul says, I am willing to personally experience Whatever burden I have to bear as a believer, whatever target I have to become uh, for persecution, whatever hardship I have to endure in order to do the will of God, I'm willing to suffer whatever that burden-bearing hardship might be. And in doing so, that's the way in which I will know the power of God. That is the way that God's power is released into our lives through our suffering so that it is potentially equivalent to raising a dead body to life it's through suffering. Power of God. You want to know it? This is practical knowledge. This isn't book knowledge. This is practical. You want to experience it? You have to be willing to suffer for Christ. And then he goes on to say, being made conformable unto his death. Well, the only way that any of us would be willing to suffer is if we have arrived at a point in our life where we have become selfless. 
That's what it means to be made conformable unto his death. It's living with Christ at the center of your life and not self any longer. To be made conformable, that is, uh, to be coming or growing into conformity with Jesus' death, which was a selfless act. It's a passive uh, verb, by the way, as well, being made conformable. It's, a, it's something that you allow the Lord to do in your life, is what it means to die to self. That following the Lord, doing God's will, whatever it costs, that's what it means to be made conformable to his death. It's a selfless life. Whatever it takes, Lord, and we sang that, by the way, in one of the songs this evening. Lord, make me Christ-like, whatever it takes. Did you know you sang that? Did you mean that? That's what Paul says. It's that selfless life. It's God doing it, following God and doing his will, whatever the cost might be. And the result is he infuses into us supernatural, life-giving resurrection power. So, do you know God? I read about Socrates, the great philosopher. Evidently, he was not only strong in his mind, but he was strong in his body, too. And a young man came to him, a student, and wanted to have the wisdom and the knowledge of Socrates. And so he said, oh, great Socrates, I want to to know knowledge. And Socrates grabbed this young man and he pulled him along and dragged him down to the water's edge. And he took him out into the water and uh, until they were in up to their shoulders. And he took this young man and he put his hands on his shoulders and he dunked him under the water and held him down a little while and let him up. And he said, what do you want? And he said, oh, great Socrates, I want to know knowledge. He dunked him again, held him down a little longer, let him up. What do you want? Oh, great Socrates, I want to know knowledge. He dunked him again and he held him down long. And when he let him up, the guy was almost, uh, had almost drowned. And he said, what do you want? He said, I want air. <laughs> and Socrates says, when you want knowledge as much as you want air, you'll have it. You'll get it. What will it take to get us to want the presence of, the, of God in our lives like that? What kind of desperate thing has to happen where we want God's presence in our life, where we want that personal, experiential, practical knowledge of Jesus more than anything else in our life, where we want that more than air, if you will, where we say, God, if you don't, if I don't have this deep, intimate, personal relationship with you, I'd rather die. I don't want to live without it. Let's pray.